Hey, Instagram. Just went live for you and getting YouTube all queued up. We should be live in YouTube, on Facebook, and on Instagram right now. All right, let's go ahead and begin. Uh, just go ahead and give me a like if you can hear me loud and clear. Just gonna make sure that our audio is coming through. Those of you on Instagram, go ahead, give me that like, let me know. And then those of you who are on YouTube, Facebook, go ahead, let me know if you can hear me okay. Once I get that thumbs up, we're gonna go ahead and get started. All right, good, looks like it's all coming through. Hey, for those of you who don't know me, my name is Thomas Tadlock. I wrote the book, Miracle Metabolism, but I'm also known as Dr. G's husband. So I am a fitness expert. I was helping Brooke get in shape for our wedding and little did we know the diet that I put her on kind of unexpectedly reversed all of her lupus symptoms and cleared up her laps so that the uh, lupus diagnosis that she used to have just completely went away. And we've taken that protocol and refined it over the years to help as many people as possible do the exact same thing and reverse lupus and virtually all autoimmune disease over the past few years, uh, faster than we've ever been before. So I'm filling in for Brooke today for the Wellness Wednesday Q&A. Uh, my background is in fitness, so I'll be able to answer all of your fitness questions. I'm also going to be able to answer any questions you have about the implementation of the protocol and the protocol itself. I'll be limited in my ability to answer questions uh, related to medical stuff. Um, I'm not a medical doctor. Um, I have a master's in exercise science and health promotion and a whole bunch of certifications. And I also help coach those uh, of us, uh, people that join our rapid recovery groups and uh, also are looking to reverse autoimmune disease. And I coach them by helping them stick to the protocol. So a lot of that has to do with mindset, the mentality of uh, success, the psychology of success and what's involved with that. So I want you to go ahead and answer, uh, ask any questions that you have. I'll do my very best to answer as many of them as I can the time that we have. We have about an hour, so let's go ahead and get started. I'm going to go ahead and get started on the YouTube side. And first one, that's hopefully you can see this. On the Goodbye Lupus Protocol, this is from Peter. Is it okay to eat mostly cruciferous and not so much spinach and chard? I'm going to go ahead and answer these questions one at a time. So the first question is, yeah, it's absolutely okay to eat mostly cruciferous and you don't, there's no reason uh, for you to eat spinach. Uh, chard is actually cruciferous, but that's okay. If you don't have a preference of eating those, that's fine. All the other cruciferous vegetables are, are hugely nutritious, extremely dense. They're gonna be able to accomplish the goal of uh, nourishing your body. So if you've got a disease that you're trying to reverse or you're trying to reduce inflammation, that's the way to go. You're gonna be fine with any of the other cruciferous vegetables. Uh, and you also don't have to have spinach if you don't like it. Is it okay to drink warm slash hot water? Absolutely it is. Uh, what about distilled water? That's an interesting question. Uh, I don't really know the answer to that. I can tell you uh, from what I've observed, I've got a lot of bodybuilding friends that would switch to distilled water shortly before they're about to appear on stage in their contest because they believe that that water uh, gives them a whole lot less bloating. But honestly, I don't really know what the negative side effects could possibly be of distilled water. Never really looked into it. It's not really a question that comes up a lot. Uh, I'd say everybody who's ever done our rapid recovery protocol, they just stick with uh, regular water. So I couldn't tell you about distilled water. Uh, no fruit at all, even more beneficial. You know, this is an interesting one because you would think that Fruit should be okay for the most part, and that's what we believe, but it's weird. We've seen uh, quite a few people do better on less fruit or even no fruit. We've had a few people in our Smoothie Shred group on Facebook uh, report that once they go no fruit at all, they finally get all the way to the finish line. Now, this isn't everybody, but this is some people. I can tell you from the bodybuilding world that bodybuilders a long time ago kind of figured out that the less fruit they eat, the better they seem to do, the, the more conditioned they're able to get their physique to look. Um, not sure exactly what the exact mechanism behind that is, because, you know, when you look at the science and what fruit's made of, it is made up of a lot of good vitamins and minerals. And then when you look at the carbohydrate contact, the main carbohydrate is fructose. And you're going to read a lot of stuff saying that fructose is A-OK -okay when it comes to fat loss. But for some reason, from a results standpoint, uh, I'm going to tell you that the majority of my bodybuilding friends get way more ripped, including myself, get way more ripped when we go off of fruit and stick to almost all vegetables. So I'm going to say, test it for yourself. Try it with fruit. 
And then you establish a baseline after a few days. I'm, I'm not sure if you're trying to heal or you're trying to get ripped, whatever the case may be, give yourself a baseline, trying it with fruit, and then use the same amount of time going without fruit and then just compare the results between the two and see which one works better for you. Uh, flaxseed needs to go in the smoothie or not, not necessarily. Uh, flax oil, I mean, it's the best way to do it. So flax oil is in the most convenient way possible is you put it in the smoothie, you blend it up and you can't even really detect that it's there. You don't taste it because flax oil is, in my opinion, it's a little bit nasty. Um, Omega-3 fatty acids kind of give you that fishy smell, a little bit of a fishy taste. I mean, it's omega-3 fatty acids. And when they, once they start oxidizing, you get that fishy smell. So that is my preferred way of ingesting it. But I've had people that just shoot it down and then chase it with water. So however you need to consume it is fine. I think the smoothie way is the best way to go. All right, from Facebook, how do you get rid of visceral fat? Well, you know, the thing is, it's the same way that you get rid of any body fat on your body. So it's understanding that every time you take a breath and you expire carbon dioxide, there is fat oxidation going on in your body 24 seven, all day long. What you have to do is you, when you're trying to get rid of visceral fat, you have to increase the amount of activities that encourage more of that fat loss process to happen because there's always a balance happening every day for people that are kind of in a, in a, in a zone where they're not getting uh, any fat loss, including visceral fat loss. Um, you still have to use more exercise to do it. So my best, my, my ideal approach is raise your metabolism by eating tons and tons of cruciferous vegetables, high nutrient vegetables, eat a high dose of omega-3 fatty acids, like a half a cup or more of uh, flax seeds, or if you want to do like three tablespoons or more of uh, flax oil, and then drink a whole lot of water and do tons of exercise, you're going to lose that visceral fat. Your body has no choice but to. You force the net loss of body fat by forcing your body to be to create more fat loss in your body while your metabolism maximizes the output of that fat loss the higher the metabolism the more fat you can lose with the method of losing fat which is going to be from exercise so crank up your exercise that's why in smoothie shred uh the the smoothie shred protocol the original one that i created when i created that group is Let's help people lose fat easier. How do I do that? Is I have them pound a big smoothie, a whole blender of smoothie with a pound of vegetables a day, get some omega-3s in, get some water, and double their physical activity. So whatever that looks like for you, if you're doing a workout on a regular basis, increase your workout uh, frequency. If you're doing three times a week, do six times a week. If you're walking 10,000 steps a day, do 20,000 steps, doubling always produces a result. So I always like using that formula. A lot of people, when they do exercise, they just don't do enough of it to really see a result. So uh, really increase your exercise, increase your metabolism by uh, nourishing yourself, and then give it the time that it needs to happen. So give yourself uh, anywhere between four to eight weeks to start seeing some good results in visceral fat loss. And then document, document, document. Take pictures of yourself so that you can very clearly see the differences every couple of weeks or so. Do measurements, body weight, all that stuff. Uh, if you want a resource where I've got a lot of good stuff on how to do that, go to smoothieshred.com in the video section. There is no sign up, there's nothing to join, but in the video section, you're gonna find a lot of stuff that I have created that helps you understand and how to interpret your body weight and what's going on with body fat. Okay, it's a very, very cool video that helps shed a lot of light and connect a lot of dots for people when you watch that. On Instagram, let's see, let me scroll back a little bit here. It's good to see all of you. Thanks so much. Okay, Jilly Dilly, I ate 50 to 60 grams of fiber today. How much fiber is too much fiber? Not well, I couldn't tell you the number of grams, but what you can do is you can look at it from a result standpoint. So if it's too much fiber, the result of having too much fiber in the body is going to be, in, in uh, some people's cases, severe constipation. That means there's more uh, gastrointestinal bulk um, that is not digestible, that is more than what their current digestive system can handle. You see, in our rapid recovery groups, we have a large variety of people that come in and people have different varying degrees of gut health that come in. I mean, in fact, there are some people that come in with severe gut 
inflammation. So they're coming in with IBS, Crohn's disease. Uh, they've got some serious issues. So for them, what, how much fiber is too much is going to be different than a person that might have a perfectly healthy, actively functioning gut. So that's going to really depend on what you actually observe. So the best way to do it is it seems like you're kind of on top of how many grams of fiber you're eating. If everything is moving along just fine, you're not feeling any weird discomfort or pain, then that's telling you that you're okay. And if you want to keep pushing the envelope, increasing the amount of fiber to discover how much uh, is too much for you, uh, you could try doing that. Because the cool thing is, if you have too much and you start feeling a little discomfort, you can lower it. But I'd say, for the most part, if you're eating 50, 60 grams of fiber, I think that's a really good target, as long as you're not feeling any weird discomfort or you're getting any weird symptoms. Let me go ahead and answer another question, too. Okay, from 111 Courtney, uh, what are your thoughts on intermittent fasting for metabolism? You know what? I know a lot of people that get fantastic results with intermittent fasting, and I personally have never seen intermittent fasting interfere with somebody's metabolism. So let's understand what metabolism is. Metabolism is a word that describes like all of your cellular function. If you were to sum up every chemical and biological process that happens in your body over the course of a day, that is metabolism. It's like the CEO's summary report of what the company did for the entire day, your company being your body, okay? So your metabolism, when it's highly functioning, really highly functioning, uh, it doesn't really matter whether you give yourself an eight hour window to eat, or if you eat over the course of 14 hours that you might be awake. Uh, I've never really seen a difference in terms of body fat loss one way or the other. So I've seen seven meals a day eating every two hours work. In fact, I've seen many bodybuilder friends of mine win contests first place doing that. And then I've seen, I've got bodybuilding friends that I've interviewed that have won first place in contests that do intermittent fasting and they'll eat within an eight hour window. Some of them eat within a six hour window. I even know one guy that ate one to two meals a day. In fact, I experimented with that myself one time with muscle building. I wanted, because, you know, uh, I've always been taught six to seven days, uh, six to seven meals a day was like an ideal way to do it, but it's very impractical for some people. So I thought, Hey, let me try three meals a day. Can I build muscle? Uh, and, and also get lean on only three meals a day? And the answer was yes, I could. And myself, I've also experimented with intermittent fasting, trying the little eight hour window just to see what would happen. And the cool thing was absolutely nothing different happened. I was able to pull it off in just a, a short feeding window, a long feeding window, many meals a day, and just a few meals a day. So uh, I think uh, intermittent fasting doesn't really have an effect on metabolism. I think what's ma what matters is the total aggregate of all the nutrient that you get, all the nutrition that you get on a daily basis. Okay, let's go back to YouTube. Hey Gail, my husband and I are doing the goodbye autoimmune protocol. Have you helped many people with mercury toxicity? toxicity? Does this protocol help clear toxins naturally? I don't know the answer to that question. Sorry about that. Let me go ahead and answer another one. Let's see. Okay, Dean and Paul. Should I be drinking, eating more, or holding back working out while doing goodbye lupus protocol? I'm a distance runner and perimenopause diagnosed lupus after sudden pericarditis. Uh, I run and lift five times a week. Okay, interesting. This is actually a valid concern because when you are an athlete, whether it's a recreational athlete or a professional athlete, there's a concern here. How am I going to get enough carbohydrates to be able to give me the energy that I need to perform all the exercise I'm going to do on a daily basis? This is kind of a tough question because the truth is, if you've ever done any of our goodbye lupus protocols, so like uh, our extreme versions of it, or even hyper nourishing, uh, it's very difficult to get massive, massive, massive quantities of raw vegetables in every single day. It's a lot of work. And you know, there's only so much space that your stomach has every single day. It has to be structured. Uh, you have to pretty much do like in, in the case, in your case where you're an athlete, you have to do the eating every two hour strategy from the moment you wake up, you have no choice, but to get six or seven meals in every single day, just to be able to get all of the carbohydrates necessary to be able to fuel your workouts. So what you do is you eat the biggest meals you possibly can on protocol. So 
Some people, what they try to do is oh, overdose on the fruit side, or they try to bring in other carbohydrates. I'd say if you have, if you've got a diagnosis of lupus, the number one priority is we got to heal the lupus. We got to completely reverse that. This is a big deal. So be okay if you have to kind of cut back on your training temporarily so we can resolve the disease, then you can go back to doing the hardcore training and introducing the foods that you used to, to supply the carbohydrates and the fats and the excess fats that you needed to sustain those workouts. But in the meantime, let's test a few things out. So we've had some athletes do our program and there's been some that have been able to actually do it just fine with the protocol, eating six to seven meals a day. They were able to eat huge amounts. I mean, they were doing, there were some folks that were doing about 70 to 90 ounces of raw vegetables a day. I mean, this is an insane amount, okay? Huge, huge amounts of food. I mean, you would wonder like if their jaws got extra hypertrophy because of all the chewing they had to do all day or you know how they had to go through how many smoothies every single day to be able to pull that off. But nonetheless, they did it. So they did about 24 ounces of fruit and then they were doing like anywhere between 60 to 90 ounces of raw vegetables and then a few extra veg other vegetables that are not in the cruciferous family. On top of that, they were doing over a gallon of water a day and they were doing about three quarters to a cup of flax seeds or chia seeds a day, really maximizing the nutrition intake and those athletes, they were able to do just fine. Now, it's all relative, though. It depends on how much you train. So if you're training for hours per day, that still might not even be enough. So in a case like that, where you are just maxing out your total food intake, I mean, you just can't fit another ounce in your body anymore. And you're trying and you've got a, and you have a lupus, lupus diagnosis. You really the best choice that I'm going to recommend that you make is cut back on the training, still do the training because you want to, you don't want to lose what you've earned in terms of physical fitness. So keep the training up, but just lower the amount, the volume, so that you're able to keep your diet is able to keep up with your expenditure. And you just kind of have to figure out what that is. So you put yourself on a maximum nutrition diet, you do the workouts. And if you start feeling depleted, that means that it's more, you're expending more than you're bringing in. So you have to lower the volume bit by bit until finally you reach a nice equilibrium so that your muscles are able to restore those glycogen stores. You've got enough carbohydrates to sustain those workouts so you're not completely wiped out. It's just a matter of adjusting volume and frequency down so that you can handle it. Once the lupus is gone and you've locked those results in, then we can start bringing in the other foods that you would typically see endurance athletes eat, you know, lots of complex carbohydrates, uh, even greater amounts of fat. You can even go higher protein as well. And then if you do that, your body is not going to feel harmed. You're not going to get the inflammation back. Okay. So heal first and then start, we can add the uh, other performance enhancing foods afterwards. Let's go back to Instagram. All right, Kelly LaBelle, how do I break up the nine hours of workouts, the nine hours of workouts between strength and cardio for fat loss? Okay, so let me give you some context. So a lot of people that see me for rapid fat loss, they are desperate to lose body fat. And those are typically people that have tried a lot of things. And then I also get a lot of people that are currently in an exercise program. They're working out five times a week. I've had a person who was working out with a trainer three to five times a week. And then this person was also doing the protocol like perfectly and was wondering why weren't they more ripped? And when I'm helping people get rapid results, so this is not someone who's going from the couch to being on stage tomorrow. That's not going to happen. But for people that really want to maximize their fat loss, uh, I will put people up through up to nine hours of exercise per week. When you compare that to the normal person that's working out like three times a week, I guarantee we're by increasing your exercise output by three times, you are going to get results. Your body has no choice. So we'll go all the way up to nine hours per week. Now, how do you divide that up? Uh, it's kind of cool. You, you actually have the freedom to mix it up and it really can go based on your own genetic predispositions. If you've ever met a lot, of, I've, I've been able to work with 
over a thousand people for fitness. And it's so cool because I see varieties in genetic predispositions when it comes to fitness. There are people that are just built for cardiovascular. There's also people that are just built for strength and they suck at cardiovascular. And then there's people that are kind of in between. Well, the best thing to do is to really focus on your strengths and jump and really leverage that, try to increase that to the highest level. So if you're a cardiovascular person, then you, how about do the majority of your, and when I say majority, I'm talking about, let's go 60% of good, hard cardio because your body is built for it. It can take it. It will thrive with it. And then the other 40% go hard weight training. And so what that could look like is you could do in nine hours. So you got nine hours to do it. You could do three hours per week of strength training. So three hours. So Monday, Wednesday, Friday, strength training, strength training, strength training. And then since you're doing three times a week, you would do pretty much full body hitting big muscle groups, big lifts overall, building it, trying to build as much strength as possible. And then all the in between. So even on that, on those days, Monday, Wednesday, Friday, you're also going to do a 30 minute cardio high intensity interval session on those three days. And then the other days you fill those in with uh, one hour to one and a half hour cardiovascular workouts. If you're more on the strength side of things, then mix it up by doing the majority of it strength training, 60, 70% of it from heavy weight lifting five days a week, going for an hour to an hour and a half per week, and then fill in the rest with cardio, high intensity interval cardio. It could be low intensity, steady state cardio, whatever it is. When you start doing nine hours of exercise per week, you're going to see a huge difference. And then what happens is once you establish the nine hours per week as a baseline, then what you do is you try to increase your performance on every one of those areas, all nine hours, try to do a little bit more, try to do a little harder, try to do a little stronger. That's pretty much uh, how you do it. Let's go back to YouTube. I appreciate those of you who are actually helping out answering questions for people in the chat itself. All right, let me see if I can scroll down and find a question. Okay, Bianca, hi. Hi, Dr. G. How much time would need to be waited in order to get an appointment scheduled after I got the rush add-on roughly estimated? Oh, good question, Bianca. So the rush add-on. So as you can imagine, Dr. G is insanely booked, insanely booked. So she added this thing called the rush add-on which allows you to get to the uh, top of the list a lot sooner. So I believe right now that's about two to four weeks versus two to four months to see her. Another option that you have to, if uh, you need help for nothing more than implementing the protocol, you need someone to make sure that you're doing the whole protocol right, I'm actually available to take on appointments. If you have any fitness questions, of course, you need help with your fitness goals. Obviously, I can help you with that. But when it comes to implementing the protocol, and there's nothing that uh, I would need to do that is concerning your particular medical condition, any customizations. You don't need me to look at your labs or anything like that. You can actually sign up for a point with me and I can help you do that. My son has type 1 diabetes. This is from Catherine. Let me go ahead and show this. Okay. My son has type 1 diabetes and severe gastroparesis. She has a stomach simulator install, but it doesn't seem to be helping. Can you or Dr. Golden? Ooh, that's a question I can't answer. Okay. There's a lot of very verbose questions here. So it's taking me a second to read through all of them. Okay, this is an easy one. When on the goodbye autoimmune protocol, I've seen some posts by people suggesting tomatoes and cucumbers are actually considered fruit and therefore should be minimized and included in the fruit toll for the day. Is this correct? We don't really care about the argument or the difference in the labels that we give those things. So we consider tomato and cucumber in the vegetable category for our intents and purposes. 
Is tomato a fruit? Yeah, it is. Is cu cucumber a fruit? Yes, it is. But it is also considered a vegetable in other contexts as well. So in our context, we are considering both of those as other vegetables. You can have as many of those as you uh, as you want, no problem, unless you've identified a particular uh, reaction or negative reaction to either of those, which you'd obviously eliminate it. But as a category um, in whole, no problem. Uh, we would just put those in vegetables. Okay, can you talk about losing belly fat near or after menopause? Well, here's the thing. So near or after menopause, you have to understand that, well, we all know this, your hormones play a massive role in your body's ability to lose fat, gain muscle. It is so much about hormones. But everybody, every, every uh, biological female goes through menopause. We know that. So there's going to be a hormonal shift, which is something you can't stop. It's just going to be something you're going to have to deal with. So what we can do, the strategy is going to be the same. We got to raise metabolism as much as your body is able to. So if you're not able, and you don't have to have these expectations, if you're not able to get the same metabolism that you were back when you're in your 20s, uh, be okay with that. Be okay with that. Now we actually end up helping people get that metabolism back when they were 20s, but be okay with that not exactly happening because it's your genetic predispositions that determine what's going to happen to you. We're going to use nutrition to give you the best version of whatever is supposed to happen to you. So if we want to be able to increase fat, we want to do fat loss exercise. If we want to stop or minimize the storage of excess body fat, we have to eat nutritiously and eat in a way where we're not creating that excess body fat. So you would want to do like any form of our goodbye lupus protocol, goodbye autoimmune protocol, which is really stick with the majority, if not all your diet from the super high nutrient vegetables like the cruciferous vegetables and spinach, any other vegetables on top of that, try to keep your fruit to a low level. I'd say no more than 24 ounces a day, even less if you can. Keep your omega-3 fatty acids on the high side. So go with like a handful or a half a cup or more of flax seeds or chia seeds, or you could do oil. High water intake, 96 ounces or above, and exercise. Workout, workout, workout. So if you're going to go through menopause, be strong as you do it. Let your body continue to be strong. Never give that up. And if you haven't been working out, then it's a perfect time to start because you want to go into menopause uh, in, in stronger with more endurance because this is important as we get older. We want to be more fit or as fit as we possibly can get. So begin your exercise routine if you haven't already. And again, use my double or tripling strategy. If you're already trying that right now and you're not getting results, well, guess what? Stick with our, our dietary guidelines and then double or triple your activity during the day. You're going to start seeing results. Okay, Instagram. Green smoothie recipes, please. Okay, I'll tell you where to go to get those. You go to smoothieshred.com and then you're going to see a link at the top that says smoothie recipes. There's no sign up. There's no need for your email. You just go there. The recipes are favorite recipes that we use are all right there. All right, Melody, just bought your book, can't read, read it, good, cool. Hope you enjoy it. Oh, that's a good one. Okay, so I get, we get this a lot. Dr. G has answered this uh, many times about oxalates on the vegetables or in the vegetables. So it's, uh, if you don't have a pre genetic predisposition or you don't have any sort of issues right now, currently with kidney stones, you're pretty much safe to eat any of the vegetables that are on our list. You know, spinach becomes like the big one that everybody's afraid of when they have those things. So, you know what? It's just wise. If you have a kidney stone issue, all right, let's just avoid the spinach just to be safe. But in my personal experience and the experience of working with so many people, we just really don't see it. When we're monitoring people and looking at them, again, our guidelines are always, our recommendations are always, that, look, if you've got a kidney stone issue or uh, you, you have the potential for one, then we're not going to take any chances. We're going to stay away from the spinach, okay? But for everybody else, no problem. And uh, me personally, I like, I love spinach. I'll eat a pound or more per day, and I've been doing it for decades. Never had a kidney stone, never had an issue. So if, the, if it was something to be concerned with, to the point where we would wanna change our guidelines um, 
then we would actually be seeing this at a matter of scale. You know, in, 50, in, in Smoothie Shred, we have over 50,000 members in there. And I got to tell you, there are lots of people that are doing it with spinach. And if it was really, if the, if the, oxid, if the uh, oxalates were causing these big issues, we would actually see it at scale. We do see occasional couple, handful of people, one or two, once in a while. But the thing is, we don't exactly know particularly where it comes from because nobody was observing them looking over their shoulder. So it's hard to say. So our answer for this is, uh, if, you have, if you have a condition that is making it contraindicated for you to have a high oxalate level or to ingest any foods with high oxalates, well, you know what? It might be a good idea just to stay away from those. Spinach being uh, one of the big ones. The other vegetables you should be absolutely fine with. Boss babe, my daughter has kidney disease, but also has very low iron and very low on vitamin D. What do you recommend to eat to help? Well, you know what? I have seen uh, in our group, we have seen people that have low vitamin D levels. It's actually a very common thing. Most people we see when they go and get their blood work done, they actually have low vitamin D levels. I even had low vitamin D levels at one point too. Shocked me. I couldn't believe it. And the other question about the iron, very low iron. I have seen supplementation work like magic, just supplementation, just the type of supplements you literally can buy off of Amazon or go to your local natural foods grocery and find the iron supplements and the vitamin D supplements. And oh my gosh, I see people bring up those levels dramatically. I did it myself. Uh, we uh, used, a I used a vitamin D supplement. Brooke found it, it was just off of Amazon. I'm sure you can find it if you go to her Amazon link, which you can find at goodbylupus.com. And it has the exact vitamin D that we used. And I remember using it for just about six weeks and then got my blood retested and boom, I went from super low to right there and the absolute optimal level, dead center in the middle of the, of the range that you wanna be in. So I've seen supplement work, I've, it's worked for me. It's worked for uh, just about everybody we were worked with. Okay, let's go over to We'll go back to Facebook. D, my husband and I have been doing goodbye lupus protocol for 18 days. Good job. Uh, we both have autoimmune illnesses that seem to have been triggered by COVID. I'm sorry to hear that. I am seeing improvements, but after an initial few days, my husband feeling better, his knee and joint pain has come back and is almost as bad as when we first started. We are doing everything that the protocol requires. Uh, is a setback like this typical? And if he's feeling like this, should he try to push through it or should he be resting more? Okay, so here's, uh, here's what's interesting. So if you're doing goodbye lupus protocol and let's, we'll go ahead and give you the benefit of the doubt that you are doing everything correctly. You're definitely lowering your inflammation, systemic inflammation, but I do know a lot about knee pain and joint pain. You can't rule out that you don't have an injury. And this is something where if you're eating a diet that is extremely anti-inflammatory, then you start seeing an increase in uh, joint pain. You want to rule out that you don't have a physical impairment that's creating that. So that is also the time for you to go to your physician, your physical therapist, your sports medicine doctor, and you want them to have it checked out. Maybe you never know. Maybe you have a cartilage issue. Maybe you have an injury in there. Maybe you have a strained patellar tendon that's causing that pain and nutrition uh, is not going to be something. I mean, it's going to help with that, but it's not going to just make it not ever happen. So you want to make sure that you rule out those anatomical issues first, because uh, it might be. And, and what's cool is when it comes to physical issues like that, it, sometimes you could have a, a muscle that is completely knotted up. It's causing excess strain on your patellar tendon. And then the solution is super, super easy. You can just go ahead and foam roll out the quadricep muscles right above it. And then suddenly the knee pain goes away. Uh, or it could be something harder. Maybe you've got a meniscus tear that you didn't realize that you had. My father, my own father had that happen. He had a, uh, he had a major knee injury he didn't even realize that he had. He just suddenly one day felt severe pain in his knee. And it turns out they actually tore his meniscus just getting into a car, getting into a car. And right at that time, he thought that 
when he got, he thought that it had to be because of a new medication that he was taking that has to do that uh, to help with some Alzheimer's type of stuff, right? He thought, oh, it must be the medication. It wasn't because it's easy to connect those two, right? No, it was just literally getting into the car incorrectly, uh, not being in the best shape possible, and he created that injury. So they have to fix the meniscus tear, not change the medication. So we got to rule out, we got to figure out what is the actual cause of that. Eating in a way that lowers in uh, inflammation, that's not going to be the cause of the knee pain. You got to figure out what the cause is of the knee pain, but eat, continue eating that way because it's the most nutritious way. So if there is an injury, you're going to increase your ability to heal that injury. Okay. Uh, Billy, have you guys seen negative effects of cruciferous? Uh, her TSH level shot up after a month on high nutrient. All the while, my results were great on goodbye autoimmune protocol. Uh, no, I haven't seen that actually. What are the, ne the where TSH shoots up as a result of cruciferous? There's something else going on. There's a hundred percent something else going on. That's that's what I can tell you. We, we've uh, we've seen we've seen weird blood work happen and. Every single time we've been able to find the culprit. I've never seen the culprit in all the years that we've been doing this. I've never seen the culprit be broccoli or kale um, causing the TSH to go up. Uh, oftentimes there is something completely different going on. One thing that's going around big time or has been over the past few years, we've seen COVID completely wreck people's labs. And what's funny about that one is that well, it's not really funny, but What's interesting about it is it takes, it takes a few days for someone to even know they have COVID and then boom. Now I'm not saying it's, I'm not saying that's what you have, but what I'm saying is these, that's a COVID's a really great example of how many times we've seen people have their blood labs get look like suddenly everything is going wrong where in all they believe they have done. The only thing they've made a change in their life has been the diet. So they just connect the two like, Oh, it must be because I'm suddenly eating raw vegetables, a lot of them that, it's wrecking my, my TSH in my labs. But meanwhile, we discover after three days later, oh, they got COVID, which means they, they have had COVID for that duration. So it could, it's going to be something else. Yeah, all right, ML Larson, Instagram. How much green smoothie can I give my 19 month old toddler? Usually I have spinach and green kale. All right, so. Uh, what we did with our 19 month olds, both of them, we started, um, so let's see, that's 19 month. Okay. So we did two years of breast milk, but at around the 19 month mark, we were doing a combination of smoothie and breast milk. So our, our, our kids, both of them, they love green smoothie. And so what we would do is we'd fill up their little bottle with about three quarters to two thirds of the way breast milk, and then fill the rest in with smoothie. And it made for the craziest looking smoothies because they were green and, and sometimes at uh, at daycare or uh, whenever someone else would see this they're drinking this greenish milky colored thing Th their minds they were thinking we're just giving our kids this moldy spoiled milk but meanwhile we're just loading up with uh, nutrients and so we kind of like started uh, at the 19 month mark so again we, two years of breast milk right around that time we we're beginning the transition process of going from breast milk to all smoothies. So it would be uh, a quarter smoothie and then two thirds smoothie, and I'm sorry, and then one third smoothie, half and then two thirds. And then eventually it was all smoothie by the two year mark. So give that a shot. It's gonna make your child healthy. All right, Sharice, how many minutes per day should you exercise to heal your autoimmune disease? So, you know, that Brooke worked out really, really hard when we were uh, unknowingly reversing her disease. And it took a few years for us to really realize what exactly could the influence of exercise be in it. So we know exercise, it is a incredibly beneficial thing to do. It is probably the most, one of the most underutilized but healthy practices that any human being can do. We were meant to move our bodies all of this equipment that we have that is meant to be moving, uh, not sitting still. So one thing we know about exercise is that when we start exercising and not just walking, I mean, real exercise where you get your heart pumping hard, 
is you get circulation and blood flow. That means you are taking more oxygen, delivering it to the places that need them the most. You're also taking metabolic wastes that are stuck in different parts of your body and you're getting that out. You're filtering that out at the same time. Now, uh, when you do hard exercise, really intense exercise where your heart is beating extremely hard, and this is only for those of you that have the all clear by your physician to do this, but when you work out extremely hard, you force your heart to pump really, really hard with a lot of force. And you have to imagine, you have to picture your heart like a pump. And the harder you pump it, you can, I want you to imagine the fluid, the blood, really getting pushed into the, all the different places of your body. You're able to force nourished blood into all the deep capillaries and all the limbs and areas of your body that usually might have more or less a poor blood supply or poor circulation. So we're increasing the amount of blood exposure and nutrient exposure to all areas of your body, the harder you work out. So the question about how many minutes per day should you exercise to heal your autoimmune disease? Well, we don't have a requirement that you do, but we do know that it is a potential accelerator for that reason, when you think from a physical standpoint that you ingest food, food of the, the nutrients of that food eventually has to reach your blood stream in order to be delivered to all the areas of your body. When you exercise hard enough, you're actually accelerating and improving the nutrient delivery system in your body. So I don't know how much it takes. Exercise by itself is not going to heal your autoimmune disease, but we know it can accelerate it. So I like to see as many minutes as possible. Always be in a state where you're trying to improve your physical fitness, no matter where it is. If right now the most you can do is 10 minutes, perfect. That's fine. Do the 10 minutes and keep trying to push that envelope further so you can, you can grow that 10 minutes to 15 and then to 30 and then to 45 and then an hour. You want to keep pushing that limit. Okay. Whatever it might be. Okay. Technical question. YouTube Mel, how much almond milk is allowed on good autoimmune protocol? Some say half a cup, some say one cup. Right now, we want to do, first of all, the type of almond milk. We want to stick with the unsweetened almond milk. And you want to keep your fat uh, content on the low side, like try to be three grams or under per cup. And then just to be safe, try to keep your almond milk to one cup or less. One cup or less. That's eight ounces or less. Okay. Insta. Shell. Be the light. Are eating a lot of omega-3s bad for the liver? Lots of plant-based approaches say to do low fat to no fat. Thank you. All right. So based purely on our results, purely on the results, we have never, ever, ever seen anybody develop liver complication when consuming high-dose omega-3s. We've been doing this for uh, decades now, and we're talking tens of thousands of people at this point. I've just never seen it. So if there is a limit where it's bad for the liver, we have not been able to reach it and we've never seen it. Uh, C stone SK eight, how much vegetables flax for a 67 pound child? Okay. If I were to think of what would be a starting point for a child, it's 67 pounds. You can kind of like, I think you can get by on dividing what it would be for a normal adult in half. So, you know, if you're going to have, let's say a goal of 24 ounces of cruciferous vegetables, make it a goal of 12 per day for your child. And also based on their ability to consume that much, really what it comes down to, because again, unless they're trying, unless we're trying to heal them from a disease and you're just trying to keep them healthy, really just make the guideline as much as they can be comfortable with. That could be 10 ounces, might be eight, might be 12, or could it be even 16? We're not quite sure. But try to do as much as you can from the vegetable side. For the flax oil or, or the omega-3s, oh my gosh. Well, here's what we do know. You put kids on omega-3 fatty acids, they become smarter, they do better, they grow better. So again, I would say use the half, the one half guideline. So you figure like an adult that is on average 150 to 200 pounds, 
that's 150 to 200 pounds of tissue versus 67 pounds of tissue, which is a little less than half of that. So let's, uh, let's just divide it in half. Let's say a quarter cup of flax seeds or chia seeds per day. You could do it in the form of like some chia pudding, you uh, blend it up, grind it up, and then immediately add some uh, almond milk with some fruit on it. They'll love it. It's going to be delicious. All right, another really quick question. Uh, Dylan Mini, where do you get your protein from? Cool thing is amino acids live in just about every single food that we eat. There is protein, believe it or not, in our flax seeds and our chia seeds. There's protein in every single vegetable that we eat. Did you know there's even a gram or more of protein in a banana? All the fruit that we eat has protein in it. So uh, we've never actually seen a protein deficiency ever happen in anybody we've ever worked with. Um, in all of our groups and all of our different programs over the past few decades, never once have we ever seen uh, any symptoms of protein deficiency. That's a good thing. So it helps us kind of figure out or realize that uh, we actually need less protein than we've always thought. You know, I did a really cool experiment a long time ago. You might be able to find this on YouTube. Uh, you can also go to veganmuscleproject.com. I created, or sorry, veganmusclebook.com. I created a little ebook kind of documenting my journey on this, but I wanted to see how little protein can I get away with if I switched to plant-based. When I was a meat eater, I had to consume about 200 to 250 grams of protein every single day to be able to maintain my muscle mass and also try to put on a little extra muscle. But I was able to accomplish the same amount of muscle gain on a plant-based, 100% plant-based diet with only 110 grams of protein, half half. It's amazing. It's amazing how little I was able to get away with and still produce results, which I loved because you know how hard it is to eat all of that protein? My goodness. So to be able to cut that in half just made it so much easier. All right. Let's go over to uh, Facebook. Steven, good to see you too. Thank you for that. Okay. Thank you so much for the protocol. I've lost 30 pounds of weight with goodbye lupus protocol. What do I eat afterwards? Well, I've got good news for you. If you're not healing from a disease and your whole goal was just weight loss and you've hit that goal, your question is what does maintenance look like? This is a really cool thing. So maintenance just really becomes very simple. So you're going to use pretty much the goodbye lupus protocol as your baseline foundation of your food, because we never, we know that all of our problems happen for two reasons. We undernourish ourselves. That means we're not eating enough vegetables. We're not, we're not getting enough omega threes. We're not having enough minerals and vitamins and enzymes, and we're not drinking enough water. That's one reason why a lot of problems happen Our health problems. The second reason a lot of health problems happen is because we're also eating stuff too much stuff that is actually creating damage every single day. And those are the foods. We all know what those are. The junk food, refined foods, sugar. Those things actually do damage to our bodies every single time we eat them. So maintenance is going to be in a state where you're always putting the beneficial nutrients always on the upside. So that way it can counter any of the food that causes damage to your body. So you always want to have, I'd say, about 16 ounces of raw vegetables every single day. So that can be done in a single smoothie. You always want to have about a handful of omega-3s uh, in, in your body every single day. So that's going to be anywhere between a quarter cup or so of flax seeds or chia seeds, maybe a little bit more. Um, that also is the equivalent of about one and a half tablespoons of flax oil if you want to make it easier. And you always want to get about 96 ounces of water every single day or use the clear urine strategy. So as long as your urine is always clear, you're probably good to go on the water side. So that's your baseline fundamental. Then you can go ahead and enjoy other foods on top of that. So if uh, you lost the 30 pounds and you want to lock it in, you want to be very careful about which foods you choose. So you start with the foods that are also known to go hand in hand with any sort of like aesthetic diet. So uh, beans, lentils. I did an experiment one time to try to get fat on beans and lentils and garbanzo beans. I tried, I would do, I was probably eating about four to six cans of beans a day. And I did it for 28 straight days, I actually lost two pounds. So I couldn't get fat no matter how much I tried. So you can go ahead and experiment by adding in beans into your life. Um, and you can also start increasing your fruit if you want to. And then every now and again, I would say there's, th there's this term that we have, it's called recreational eating. 
recreational eating refers to foods that really we shouldn't be eating, but you're eating it purely for flavor, not for any nutritional benefit. So, you know, it's like going out and having that really big, sloppy, uh, dripping, delicious vegan burger, um, going and enjoying some vegan ice cream. And I'm not talking about smashed bananas. I mean, like the vegan ice cream that's got some ingredients in there that aren't all natural. Use the, eat those sparingly and then just monitor what's going on with your physique and your body weight. So when you start seeing your physique go in the wrong direction, like, and, and, and watch out because sometimes you might, cons you might confuse being a little bit of bloated and having some water retention higher than normal on a one day, like after eating a really big uh, vegan uh, dinner at a restaurant that is not healthy vegan, you know what I mean? Like we want just the flavor. When you eat one of those meals, you might notice that you're a little bit more soft on your physique the next day. Don't confuse that with suddenly gaining two to three pounds of body fat. That is more than likely that you gained just a little bit more water retention give it a couple of days of going nice and clean, and then you're gonna see all that go away really quickly, okay? So don't, don't get freaked out if all of a sudden after a really big meal, especially a meal with lots of sodium, uh, foods that kind of dehydrate you. You know, if you've been drinking 96 ounces of water a day, you know the foods I'm talking about, especially beans. You know, you eat them, and it's like you can feel the water being pulled away from you, and you're, you just suddenly become more thirsty. All of those things kind of uh, contribute to you retaining water, which appears like you got fatter, but you probably didn't. So if you stick with recreational eating, maybe once or twice a week tops, you're going to be just fine. But again, if you start seeing your physique go in the wrong direction, you start climbing up and weight over the course of two, three, four weeks, then all you do is you increase your exercise, go back to clean eating, bring it right back down, and then adjust a little bit, have a little less recreational eating than you did before. But from that point, like I said, keep the nutrition, the high nutrient part of the diet as your foundation for the rest of your life. And then you can start incorporating and adding other foods, knowing how to manage it from here on out. Okay, Instagram, let's go back to you. Thank you all, by the way. I just wanna say thank you for putting so many questions up. Wish I could answer all of them but we do our best by putting these on every week. Okay. Uh, oh, no. Can this protocol help with psoriatic arthritis in a 29 year old? Actually, we have seen this protocol uh, drastically improve psoriatic arthritis. Uh, we, it was just recently in a, uh, maybe one or two rapid recovery groups ago, uh, we had someone with psoriatic arthritis and it started to really improve big time and within the six weeks. Um, ah, okay, so here's a question about, okay, wouldn't a nine hour week cause overtraining and put more stress on the body? It, it, it depends. If you're working out nine hours per week and you're not fit for it, yeah, it'll cause overtraining. So the whole idea is to get to, to get to the point where you're able to do nine hours. So again, if you're starting from maybe one hour a week, you're not going to do nine hours per week. You'll go from one hour and then you're going to double it. You'll go to two. And then once that becomes something you're able to do and sustain, then you shoot for four as your next goal. And then once four hours become sustainable and you're able to recover from it, then your next goal is going to be eight. Okay. So you gradually step your way up to that. You, you don't just suddenly throw it on because, uh, your body actually won't even allow you to. The interesting thing about overtraining, you know, where I see overtraining happen the most is actually when people don't get enough sleep, in addition to not enough nutrients, but that doesn't really, happen. doesn't happen on this protocol. But when you don't get enough sleep, your body just doesn't have the time that it needs to be able to fully recover. So you really have to have everything dialed in. In order to be able to pull off nine hours, not only do you have to do the work, but your eating has to be spot on. You got to be nourishing your body like religiously on a schedule regimented every single day and your rest and your recovery that has to be spot on as well. So you got to be getting that, uh, I'd say eight or more hours of sleep every single night. And trust me, if you're working out nine hours per week, you're going to be sleeping that long. I guarantee it. And then on top of that, let's not also forget the other stresses in your life. So uh, you want to make the rest of your life as managed and easy as possible. And I'm, I don't mean not go to work. I mean, 
you want to like, if you're going to be under a lot of emotional distress, that can actually put, uh, that can interfere with things, which interferes with sleep and so on. But sometimes having all that exercise helps you deal with all that stress. But uh, the idea is you get in shape to be able to do the nine hours. Okay. Uh, can we do the protocol and just drink smoothies? Sal, just send it uh, right now. Love the broccoli. Oh my gosh. So I'm going to tell you, doing it, we've had, we've had people in our four week and our six week programs where they're like, I don't want to make all this food. I don't want to deal with having to prepare all of my food all the time. I want to keep it as simple as possible. Nothing is more simple than a smoothie. You can make a smoothie in five minutes. So we've had people just do like two giant blenders of smoothie a day. And that's it. That took care of all of their food needs. It took care of all their omega-3 needs. It took care of being full all day. And they pretty much got like 90% of all the water that they needed in per day just from that alone. And we've had the people, the people that have done that, they loved it because whether it's in smoothie form or salad form or like just, you know, finger picking the vegetables in your mouth. It doesn't matter what the form factor is. What matters is you just get the nutrition in your body and doing it with smoothies. That is the way to go. Because if your whole food prep in a whole day amounts to 10 minutes a day, that is so sustainable. And what that does is it mentally frees you from having to worry about like, you know, you got other things that you have to worry about in your day, right? You have your other responsibilities. You might have your job, you might have your family, you might have other things that you have to do every single day. What you don't want is to make nutrition the thing that you spend all day doing. So the way you can do that is with just smoothies. So it's a great way to do it. I think you're going to be able to uh, do great if that's what you do. And also, it makes uh, decision making around food so easy. What's for dinner tonight? Smoothie. What's for breakfast? Smoothie. What are we having tomorrow? Smoothie. Easy. It's like having one thing on the menu. <laughs> no paralysis of decisions. All right. YouTube. What do we have? Okay, so this is from Yesenia. Let me put this up. I started hypernourished and see if it would help my IBS and digestive issues. It has helped. Good to see that. Uh, my question is, if I work with you for weight and muscle building, do I need to heal my gut first? Okay, that's actually a really good question. So I'm going to say for muscle building, yes, you're going to want to you want to heal your gut because when it, when we do hardcore muscle building, the foods that we consume for that. Well, sometimes if you don't have a if you don't have a normal or healthy gut at that point, it can put a lot of strain on it because we're eating way more, way way more. In order to build muscle, we have to really exceed the amount of food that we normally feel like eating on a daily basis. We have to overconsume. In order to grow bigger and create more tissue in our body, we need an overdose of all food, all nutrients. But for weight loss, believe it or not, you can actually use that to your advantage. So for people with IBS, they find it a difficult time to eat uh, a ton of food anyway. So people who are typically looking for weight loss, their big issue is they can't stop eating. They overeat too much. But if you happen to have IBS, well, guess what? It actually makes it easier to not overeat. So that can actually be an advantage. So you add exercise to the equation as we're putting you through a version of a goodbye lupus protocol. So if you have IBS, we might have to make some modifications. We might have to stick with foods that are a little bit more gentle on the gut. Sometimes we've uh, resorted to adding juicing into the protocol too, so that that way we have a little less bulk moving through your gut, which can actually uh, make it a little easier for you not to trigger any discomfort in your gut, but still get a really decent high amount of nutrients. And then as the gut becomes uh, healed, then we start increasing the amount of uh, higher fiber, higher bulk foods in, and you're good to go. In the meantime, though, we start hitting you with exercise and making that a regular habit. So what happens is, well, you're eating a little less food than normal anyway, because of the IBS, we're fully nourishing you. So therefore we're raising your metabolism. And then we're adding exercise on top of that to the level that you're able to keep up, your nutrition is able to keep up and make you feel good and make you feel ready for workouts. And then guess what you get? A net loss in body fat. It's a beautiful thing. 
Okay, uh, another really quick question someone's asking, how do I work with you, Thomas, if you want to work with me? You just go to goodbylupus.com and you're going to do, uh, go in as if you're going to book a one-on-one -on -one appointment. You'll see the link that says one-on-one -on -one, uh, consultations. And once you're in that little portal, uh, you'll see that you can actually select me to find, uh, to see what my schedule looks like. So you can just book directly with me through the goodbylupus.com website. Okay, we have uh, time for just a couple more questions. I'll do another Facebook one. I'll do another Instagram one. Okay, Veronica, I think I answered this question. Oh, let me go ahead. Uh, this is a variation of this. Okay, Veronica, can you do a workout program while sticking with a goodbye lupus protocol, gaining muscle, getting ripped? Okay, muscle gain, no. But what we can do is make the muscle strong. We can make the muscle strong and stronger, but not because of tissue growth, but because your nervous system, uh, we're going to basically get adaptations in your nervous system that actually allows your muscles to be stronger than they are even at the current size, which is badass because it makes you uh, more formidable, makes you a force to be reckoned with. We call that lean and mean. Now getting ripped, oh my gosh, absolutely yes. So the entire Goodbye Lupus nutrition protocol was built off of my fat loss protocol that I put Brooke on to get ripped and shredded for the wedding. So really, in order for you to get super ripped, do the Goodbye Lupus protocol and exercise a ton and you will get ripped and shredded. And you can also increase the strength of your muscles. They won't get bigger. In order to gain mass, we have to actually have uh, an overabundance of all nutrition, especially carbohydrates, more protein, even more fat in order to build more tissue. So that won't happen. But the other goals, getting ripped, oh my gosh, it's a, a really good way to do it. Instagram, last one. Okay, love and plants. Yeah, I'll do two because this is a simple one. What's, what's the, uh, let me hide this one again. Uh, Instagram, what's the minimum protein intake to build muscle? So the guidelines with uh, typical diet, typical muscle building diets is like one to two grams per uh, weight, pound of body weight. But on a 100% plant-based diet, what I have found is I've been able, I personally have been able to build muscle and a lot of my clients have been able to do it with only one half of a gram per body weight, per body weight. But the best way to do it is I do, uh, I recommend you can do two, one of two strategies you can do. You can overdo it on protein and then get a baseline for muscle building and strength and then start cutting the protein back until you see a stall in results. You can do it the other way around, start at 0.5 and then see what happens if you move it up a little bit. If there's no difference in results, you move it back down to 0.5. Oh, that's so cool. Instagram, uh, Lynn Lavelle. My daughter finished the 28 day protocol and is thriving. Thank you so much. Oh, it's so good to hear. Thank you so much for letting us know. That is awesome. Okay, this is a great one. I'm gonna, this is my last question. Thank you, Instagram, for asking this one. This is from Wildly Bountiful Garden. Uh, I would like to understand the reason for excluding cooked vegetables from the protocol, such as mushroom and squash. We don't know the mechanism behind why certain foods or versions of foods tank people's blood work or kidney function. We don't know what the mechanism is. And frankly, it's just too difficult to, to search for it. It's not, it's not uh, knowing the reason doesn't change the method anyway. So we've seen this, especially with severe kidney function. I have seen people eat one bite, like be on the road of recovery. They are doing the protocol perfectly, strictly. They're sticking with just the foods on the list, raw format, and we're watching their kidney function, their blood work, their labs go up. And then maybe they'll have a breakdown one day or one day of weakness and they'll eat one bite, one meal of the wrong foods, including a cooked vegetable or something that's completely off plan, like a piece of junk food or one bite of a candy. And we have seen the labs literally tank as a result of that. And it's just, it's traumatizing. It is just something that, that, that rips your heart out when you see it. And because of that, and we've seen it time and time and again, we've seen it with people that have completely reversed the disease um, and not all diseases react this way. Not all of them do, but 
a lot of them. But we, we've seen we've seen kidney function uh, get worse. Uh, we've seen some we've seen people's pain suddenly get worse when that when they're not fully healed. They're on the road to getting healed and they'll eat the wrong food. And then, boom, suddenly the pain just comes back literally the day after or within an hour or two after they eat that food. I don't know why that is. Neither. Neither does Brooke. But what we do know is, well, we need to stay away from it because it seems like the most of the time when it happens, when, when they eat those foods, uh, the disease gets worse or the symptoms start coming back. So for that reason, we stay away from it. All right, everyone. Uh, we are at the hour. I gave you a little extra on top of that. Hope you enjoyed this session. I want to thank you all for tuning in today, really from the bottom of my heart. Again, my name is Thomas Tadlock. I wrote the book Miracle Metabolism, and I am Dr. G's husband. It was my pleasure. It was my honor to be able to be here with you today, answer as many questions as I could. And I know it just wasn't nearly as many as the questions that came through. Uh, so Again, our commitment to you is we will promise to keep coming back every single week to try to get those questions. And if you didn't get your question answered today, don't give up. Sign up for the next time, next Wednesday, same time. Get your question in as early as you possibly can. That will give you the best shot of getting it answered live. Uh, if you want to reach me, uh, you can always tag me in our Facebook group on Smoothie Shred in Facebook. So you go to smoothieshred.com. You can find the link that says join, and then it takes you right to our Facebook group. And you can always tag me. Use the at symbol and then start typing Thomas Tadlock, and then boom, that'll tag me. If you have a specific question, I'll be happy to do my best to answer that question for you. All right. Uh, those of you who are watching too, that happen to be signed up for any of our rapid recovery groups. I'm also one of the coaches in that group. So I look forward to working with all of you as well. And I think that's all I've got. All right. It was fun. Glad to see all of you. I hope you have an awesome day uh, and a phenomenal rest of the week. Get healthy, everybody. Uh, be happy, have a lot of energy and eat a lot of nutritious foods. Take care, everyone.